clicker. Good morning. Thank Good you morning. for coming. I'm just gonna, there we go. Okay. I'm going to tell you a story. It, it's really more of a saga because it covers about 120 years. Before I start, I want to just orient you a little bit with the story. In 1925, Enid Justin, who was a daughter of Herman Joseph Justin, the founder of Justin Boot Company, um, decided to open her own boot company in Nocona, Texas, when her family made the decision to move Justin Boot Company to Fort Worth. She had always been what she believed her dad's favorite. Um, she called him Daddy Joe. She said, I was always Daddy Joe's favorite. And Daddy Joe would have never let the boot company move from Nocona. He loved Nocona and he was committed to it. So that was her reason for staying behind, defying her family, and starting her own boot company. Remember, this is 1925. So, so I'm going to kind of start at the beginning of the story. The story begins with Herman Joseph Justin, Enid's father, who comes to Texas from Indiana in the 1870s. In 1879, he lands in Spanish Fort, Texas, which was a town on the Chisholm Trail, and begins making boots. He makes his first pair of boots there for uh, the cattle drive, the, the cowboys on the cattle drive who are coming through Spanish Fort. Spanish Fort's just below the Red River, for any of y'all who don't know. Um, it's 20 miles north of Nocona, so that may kind of orient you with that. So he starts his boot company, making one pair at a time in Spanish Fort, Texas. And th there is, the building is not there anymore. There's one building left in St. Joe. And this is just an artist's rendering of what it might have looked like back then when he was making boots for the trail drivers. That's Herman Joseph Justin. Enid's Daddy Joe, as she called him, as a young man. While he was in Spanish Fort, he met his wife, Anna Allen, who was uh, the daughter of a doctor. Oddly, Spanish Fort, this little Chisholm Trail community, had five doctors. So that kind of tells you uh, it was rough on the riding the trail. They needed doctors. He married Annie Allen. They started their family uh, in Spanish Fort. The first son was John Sullivan Justin. After a few years, and his business grew. He, he was, um, had to hire some help. He was making more boots now. And um, Annie, his wife, was helping him in the business. He saw that things were beginning to change. And one of the changes, the big changes, was the railroad coming through. The railroad did not come through Spanish Fort. It went 20 miles south, and that's where the new town of Nocona sprang up as the railroad was being built. So Mr. Justin saw that trail drives were coming to an end and times were changing and decided to move his boot company to Nocona, Texas. This is his early boot company. Um, that's Herman Joseph Justin. Let's see, you use my clicker. Right there. Love this laser. That's great. Um, of course, it was a railroad town. He could ship from there. So the company continued to grow and thrive. And those are boot racks. Boots are drying out in the front on the sidewalk in front of his boot factory. This is inside of it. Looks kind of like, kind of like a dark place to work, doesn't it? Um, this is Daddy Joe right here. Son Earl right here. And over here is son John, the oldest son, who's already an apprentice bootmaker. All of the kids, and they had uh, uh, six children, ultimately. All of them worked in the boot factory. In after school, on Saturdays, they all grew up doing that and helping with the company. That's the family. 
This is Enid right here. That are the main character in our story. It was just about, Enid was just a couple of years. Um, maybe she's maybe, I don't have a date on this photograph. It didn't have a date. But I'm thinking she's probably 12, so about a year later, um, something really important happened in her life. Um, her brother John, the oldest son, John, turned 21, and they had a birthday party to celebrate John's birthday at her house, at the family home. And they had a big, wide hall in the house, and they all danced. So the next day, she went to school, and the teacher asked her, did you, have, did you go to a party last night, or was there a party at your house? And she said, yes. He said, well, did you dance? And she said, yes. And then I'm going to read you what happened in Enid's words, because I think sometimes it's kind of nice to hear. Enid wrote a little memoir uh, when she was in her 80s, and so that's where some of these things come from. So this is what happened. This is what the teacher said. I have had instructions from the school board to suspend you for three weeks. This is for dancing. You aren't expelled, but you are suspended. It absolutely floored me, and I got mad pretty quick. I got my books, and I started walking out, and I told him, Anybody that thinks there's a party going on in my own home and I'm going upstairs to go to bed has something else to think about. That wasn't very smart, but I said it anyway. And I never bothered to go back to school. She was 13 when she quit school. So that was my first hint that Enid was going to be a strong-willed woman. <laughs> she went to work in the boot factory, full time, at age 13, which is, I think, part of the reason uh, that she had such a bond with her father. The rest of the kids all finished school and only worked in the boot company on the, after school and on Saturdays. This is the family some years later. This is Enid right here. And this is Julia Stelzer, who Enid marries. She never uh, had much interest in boys until she met Julia Stelzer. And they married in 1915. They were both 21 years old. Julius went to work in the family boot factory and learned the boot making business. That's Herman Joseph Justin, at a later age. Um, he, he became ill um, with a disease that the doctors couldn't, uh, couldn't name. They, they ended up calling it a crippling paralysis, but he traveled all over the country trying to find a cure and didn't have any luck. He ultimately suffered a stroke and he died at age 59. So that was, that was devastating for the whole family, of course, but especially for Enid. Um, at that, that, that was 1918. That same year, uh, there was a whooping cough epidemic that, in Nocona. And Enid and Julius had a daughter, Anna Jo. She was 13 months old, and she died in the whooping cough epidemic. And it never had children after, more children after that. So th that was a really bad year, losing her father and her only daughter at 13 months old. Um, and it quit work at the boot company then and did not go back until she started her own company about seven years later. Daddy Joe, before he died, had, already, had bought property on the main street in Nocona, closer to the railroad tracks, to build a new factory because he was outgrowing his factory. At this point, he had named his two older sons, John and Earl, as partners, and it had become H.J. Justin and Sons Boot Company. 
So the sons carried on with the business. They went ahead and built this new factory that their dad had planned. They built it about 1920. It was a state-of-the-art factory. Uh, the building is still there. It's just been renovated in Nocona. Uh, that was 1920. In five years, 1925, is when Fort Worth approached the Justins about moving their business to Fort Worth. Uh, the family made that decision that they were going to move this thriving business to Fort Worth where they had uh, better banking, better railroad facilities, uh, more possibilities for labor. So that's when Enid bowed her back and said, I'm not going. I'm going to stay in Nocona and open my own boot company. That's the Nocona Boot Company. This is, I think, 1938-1940, about. Um, she moved, uh, she, this was the Justin Boot Company before they built the new factory across the street in 1920. So Enid rented that building and started her own boot company. That's the interior of her boot company. And that's Enid right back there. I probably really can't, can't tell a lot about these photographs. Um, Enid was just um, had a gift for promotion. And it was something she inherited. Daddy Joe was the same way. Um, this was a most amazing uh, promotion. This was the Pony Express race. And this happened in 1939. Um, Enid organized this to publicize her boots, and cowboys would ride from Nocona to the Golden Gate Exposition in San Francisco, about 2,000 miles. So there were rules set up for the race. Um, 42 applicants filled out farms to be in the race. When race day came, um, 17 showed up to ride in this Pony Express race. There were 15 Texas cowboys, one Oklahoma cowboy, and one Texas cowgirl from Nocona. She only made it to the second day. She was caught riding in the truck, which was against the rules. So she didn't last long. That's Enid cutting the ribbon at the beginning of the race. Okay, anybody recognize the man with her? It's Eamon Carter. Mm -hmm. Eamon Carter was there. He made a little speech, and then he fired his uh, pearl-handled 45 caliber pistol to start the race. It just shows you the crowd that was there, and there's the riders. And this was the beginning of the race down the main street of Nocona. And this is how they, how they traveled. They could, the rules were set up where they would do 25 miles on one horse. They had to trailer that horse, get on the other horse, and so they did that for 25 mile stretches, relays with the horses, so the horses didn't get too tired. And ultimately, some of them made it, amazingly. Um, this is Shannon Davidson. He won the race. He was awarded 750 silver dollars, which I often wondered how he got home. <laughs> a weighty prize, right? Um, he got, um, while he was in San Francisco, he got a movie contract and did bit parts in some westerns uh, before going back to Texas. He was from Matador, Texas. Um, he was, a few years later, he was killed in a farming accident. So kind of a sad demise for the winner of the Pony Express race. Uh, another a young man named Chris Usselton from Nocona was right behind Shannon Davidson and was trying to overtake him right at the end. And his horse was hit by a car on the outskirts of San Francisco. And it broke the horse's leg. And so Chris was disqualified. So Shannon was our ultimate winner. 
This is the interior of the factory in Nocona. It continued to grow. Uh, the Pony Express race gave Enid national publicity. It was written about in newspapers all over the country. And I know that because Enid kept scrapbooks. Um, she has three scrapbooks and they're bulging and they're all clippings that people sent her in the mail from their newspapers in their hometowns about the Pony Express race. So that's what gave her national notoriety for her company and that's when it really took off. That was 1939. She added on to this factory five times to try to get space for the growing company. She did boots for um, a lot of the celebrities and cowboys and this is um, Monty Hale and his gang. This is on the set of um, the Trail of Robin Hood. Anybody seen that one? Um, okay, you recognize anybody in that picture? Yeah. Roy Rogers was in that movie. This is another, um, another cowboy movie star, Ken Maynard, with Enid, that's Ken's horse, Tarzan. This is at the Fort Worth Stock Show. I really wanted this photograph to be the cover of the book, but the press disagreed. So I just love that photo. And this was just a really racy ad, I thought, for its time, which would have been the early 1940s. I just had to put that in there. Um, <laughs> I was kind of shocked when I found that one. Oops, wait. Um, uh, Enid got her company through the Depression, through World War II. Um, there were often shortages of material during those times, of course. And she brought in a piano and put it on the floor of the factory and told her employees to play the piano and sing when there was no work to be done. She never laid anyone off through the Depression or the war. In 1948, um, the factory was no longer, could no longer hold what they needed to do. I told you it had been added on to five times. Um, and it decided she needed to build a new factory. Um, this is the architect's rendering of what would become the new Nocona Boot Company. It's on Highway 82 in Nocona. The building is still there and has recently been renovated. Um, it was a state-of-the-art factory. She traveled all over the country and went to different shoe uh, manufacturing companies and looked at everything that was new. So it was truly state-of-the-art. Um, this is the day, the grand opening of the new boot company, and it was a grand affair, and people came from all over. Um, right, let's see, right, can you see right here? This is um, a biplane flying a banner that says, congratulations, Miss Enid, on the banner. Um, and that's a story in itself. The biplane was flown by Bill Tandy, who had a, a Tandy leather company in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's not the Fort Worth Tandy Company. That was started by Bill Tandy's grandfather and was then Tandy and Hinckley. But Bill Tandy did business with Enid, and he flew in and out of Nocona as they were doing business. He was a, um, a pilot in World War II. He flew a B-26 Marauder on 50 successful missions over Europe in World War II. So this kind of a little story in itself right there. This is the inside of the new boot factory, the state-of-the-art boot factory. Can you tell the difference in the light? Look at the lighting and the windows. And it was, uh, wasn't air conditioned, it was heated. It wasn't air conditioned because they thought air conditioning would make leather mold. They later found out that wasn't the case and it was several years later it was air conditioned. This is Julia Stelzer, Enid's husband. 
1934, Enid found out that they'd been married about 20 years. Uh, Enid found out that Julius was uh, running around with a woman who worked in the boot factory. Enid was this just strong businesswoman, but in her personal life, she was very naive. Uh, and that seemed to prove itself over and over again. Um, she was the last person to know that Julius was having an affair with someone who worked at the boot company. She wanted proof, so um, one Friday night, she got a girlfriend to go with her, and they followed Julius and this other woman to see where they were going, and Enid just wanted proof. Well, Julius took the woman uh, across the Red River to Ryan, Oklahoma for dinner. Enid followed. And Enid went and got the sheriff and had Julius and the girlfriend arrested because, and she could do that because, have you ever heard of the Mann Act? It was passed in 1910. And it was, um, it was intended to stop white slave trafficking. But it got to where it was being used um, for many kinds of uh, consensual sexual activity. So, um, you could not take a woman, or a girl or a woman, across a state line for immoral purposes. So that's how Enid got Julius and the girl arrested. The sheriff took him to jail in Warica, Oklahoma. And um, Enid went, followed to the jail. I, don't, I have to read you what happened in Enid's own words because you wouldn't believe me if I told you <laughs> what's going to happen. Um, when they got there, the sheriff said, um, told her she could go see him. She didn't want to see Julius. She wanted to see the woman. She wanted to confront the woman. So the, the sheriff took her in there, and this is, this is, these are Enid word, Enid's words. They told me how to take a broom and stick her with the handle between the bars. They said I could, I could, they said I could punch her good if I could reach her. They said I could do anything I wanted to, but they couldn't give me permission to kill her. Enid chose not to physically attack the woman, but she did fire her on the spot. So, definitely a different time, right? Definitely a different time. So, Enid and Julius divorced. Julius moved to Henrietta, Texas, about 40 miles from Nocona, and opened his own boot company, Olson, Olson Stelzer Boot Company. It's still operating today. It's been revived several times, but it's going, going again. Have you, have you ever heard of Olson Stelzer Boot Company? This is Enid's second husband, Harry. Um, Harry Whitman. He was quite charming. He was definitely after her money, because by then she was doing very well. Um, she was warned by family, by friends, that Harry would not be a good choice and that he was after her money. She didn't listen. Again, she was very naive, did not make a good choice in her personal life, and she married Harry. Um, they were married about five years, and Harry came to her one day just out of the blue. He worked at the boot company, although Enid said he didn't really work. He just kind of walked through the factory and talked to everyone. So about after five years, he came to Enid and said he wanted a divorce. And he said, um, get ready, I'm going to take what you've got. And he, well, the judge disagreed. He got $1,200 in the divorce, was all. And he moved to Wichita Falls and started a boot company <laughs> with three partners called Whitburn Boots. At this point, Enid's brother, John Justin, who is 
now president of the Justin Boot Company in Fort Worth, said to her, Enid, I wish to hell you'd quit getting married. All you're doing is creating competition. <laughs> By the 1950s, Enid's company was just doing so well and she got all kinds of honors. She was asked, um, she participated in the contest to provide boots for the annual governor's convention that was going to be held in Houston. It was the first time the governors of all the states had met in Houston, in, in the state of Texas. And she submitted boots for this competition and she won that competition. So no Kona boots were presented to all of the governors at this convention in Houston. This is Herman Talmadge, the governor of Georgia then. The boots were brown boots with white butterflies and red flowers. <laughs> um, I, I, I often think that Enid would just be furious with me for putting that picture in the book, because it, it's not very flattering of her, but. Um, another governor, Adlai Stevenson, told Enid he didn't want the boots, he didn't like them. They were free. He could have just taken the boots and thrown them away, or, you know, not said, but, but he actually said that to her. Well, it turned out the Stevenson sons wanted boots. So she provided boots for both of Adelaide Stevenson's sons. But she later remarked, I wouldn't vote for him if he was running for dog catcher. <laughs> she had another, uh, all kinds of events and honors were coming her way during the 1950s. Another thing she participated in was um, Texas on the Riviera which was a Texas uh, fashion show. It went on for a week on the Riviera in France. And there, she made the boots. It was A. Harris Department Store, which was in Dallas at that time, became Sanger Harris later. Um, they were the sponsors of it, and Enid made the boots that went with these Western outfits that these models wore for this um, Texas on the Riviera show. But one just crazy story came out of that. Uh, an Abilene oil man named Jimmy Radford put on a party in France for everyone participating in this Texas on the Riviera. And he had an oil derrick that spouted cognac, and he had um, some very elaborate things for this party. But the most interesting was he had imported 100 horn toads from te West Texas, and women wore them on their shoulders like corsages. The horn toads, I, I'm thinking they were in shock after the flight, and they, so they just sat wherever you put them. So I thought that was quite interesting, and I know about this because it was written up in the New York Herald Tribune in Art Buckwald's column. So, this is the boot company in the 1960s, and uh, this, this whole end right here has now been added on. That's a retail store now. And the, the uh, landing strip, the airport at Nocona, which was small, had to be expanded because people were actually flying in to have boots made and to buy their Western clothes at her store. The, company, the, the building was too small again. And this is the early 70s. That's nephew Joe Justin, who was um, Earl's son, Earl Justin's son. Earl uh, went to Fort Worth and worked with John in the Fort Worth Justin Company. There's a lot of Justins in this story, y'all. I'm sorry, it's a little confusing sometimes. But that's Enid and Joe Justin. They decided to build a factory in Vernon, Texas, a satellite factory, because they just needed more production. A few years later, they would build another satellite factory in Gainesville, Texas. So the, it, it was really, business was booming. Um, 
that's um, a, a very well-known advertising man named Ray Ackerman. He had Ackerman McQueen Advertising Agency in Oklahoma City, and he's the one that created the Let's Rodeo campaign for an Okona Boot Company that became very famous. Um, do any of you remember these posters? That um, This was during the 1970s. Um, they always pictured a cowboy's boots, and you would see his hands, and he was fighting some kind of dangerous critter. And, but you never saw his face. And Ackerman said, that's because he wanted you to picture yourself in those Nocona boots. So very interesting campaign. This one, you might have seen. This was the number three top selling poster in the United States in the 1970s, right behind Star Wars and Farrah Fawcett. That campaign did wonders for selling boots. This is Enid in, in later years with the Lawn Ranger. Um, about in the early 80s, um, Enid decided that she needed to think about the succession of her company and who was going to take over her company. Uh, she, she was in her 80s at that time. And um, this was an agonizing decision for her because she had built this company and she had run this company for 50 plus years. It was her baby. Um, she originally contacted Thomas Forsheim of Weinberg Shoe Company, and that was in Milwaukee, about buying her company. He came to visit her. He made her, he, he said he would get back to her with an offer, but he actually came to Nocona. At that point, the cat was out of the bag that she was thinking about selling the company. She had kept that to herself. Uh, he came to visit. Um, they didn't come to any agreement at that point. And that night, she woke up in the middle of the night. She, she often tells about waking up in the night and thinking of something that she wants to do. She woke up in the night that night, and she said, perhaps I should contact John Jr. at Justin. By then, John Sr. had retired. John Justin Jr. had taken over what was now Justin Industries. So Enid, con John was her nephew. She contacted nephew, John, about merging their companies. And of course, he was, he was very interested. This is my favorite photo of her, because I think it kind of shows what her personality was like. Um, she actually signed a contract with John and then changed her mind and tried to renege on the contract and wanted the company to go instead to Joe Justin, the nephew that you saw in the photo standing by the street sign. Uh, and that's when the lawsuit started. So there were three lawsuits initiated to determine who was going to take over Nocona Boot Company. It's all documented in the book. They're very interesting lawsuits and some really interesting things happened. I'm not going to go into all of that. But in 1980, at age 86, Enid merged Nocona Boot Company with Justin Industries. Business, she stayed on as president. In 1982, she had a heart attack that further disabled her, uh, and she was homebound after that. So she resigned as president, but she remained a consultant then. Um, business continued to be good, and in 1989, Nocona Boot Company had its best year ever. They manufactured 343,000 pair of boots. And I like to think, that was 1989, I like to think that Enid knew that and thought that she had made the right decision in merging her company with family, which was very important to her. 
She died in 1990. She was 96 years old. She's buried in her beloved Nocona. Shortly after her death, um, the business really took a downturn and it was all fashion related. Boots were no longer fashionable. And Nocona Boot Company, under, the, the, under Justin, um, started cutting the workforce, cutting down. Um, finally, in 1999, they closed the Nocona Boot Company. At the same time, they closed the Justin factory in Fort Worth. They moved all production to El Paso at that time, all boot production. Um, they still make Nocona boots today in El Paso. Um, it was a, a very sad day for the town of Nocona, as you might imagine, because that had been the main employer. And you know, it was a huge boom to the, to the town of Nocona. So that was very sad for Nocona. But there uh, is a boot company that is revived there now, a young boot company, the Fenolio Boot Company. And um, the Fenolio is, were a founding family of Nocona from Italy. They were Italian immigrants. So I like to think that their company is going to go the way of a couple of other boot companies that were started by Italian immigrants, like Sam Lucchese and Tony, Ro Tony, Loma. <laughs> Tony Lama. Um, so there are boots still being made. And at one point, the workers in the boot factory in Nocona, uh, in this new boot factory, had a total of 800 years experience. Because many of the workers at, Nocona, in, at Enid's Nocona Boot Company were there for 30, 40 years. So it was a, a sad ending for that story, but Nocona boots are still being made by Justin. And just recently, they've started a Miss Enid collection, which I think is a great tribute to her. And I was really happy to see that happen. So that's the whole story. I didn't tell you it all. I'm hoping you'll want to read the book. <laughs> oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> I did. Yes. Uh huh. I do. Yes. I of course. <laughs> if you have any questions, I would I would love questions. Of course. Yes. He said, they make, uh, still Ironically, yes. Um, the Nocona Athletic Goods, Nocona's with a K. You know, they had to name it differently. It couldn't be. So the N-O-K-O-N-A is on the baseball gloves. Now has their manufacturing uh, plant in the east end of the old Nocona boot building. So it's, uh, I love that leather work is still going on in that building that had such a tradition of leather work. Good question. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what are the signs that said the boots, it looks like it said lace boots. Yes. Yes. When Enid first started out, of course, um, cowboys wouldn't buy boots from a woman. It was, it was hard going the first few years. Um, an oil field opened up just north of Nocona called the North Field. It drew in a lot of oil field workers who needed boots. Enid started making a lace-up oil field boot. And the oil field workers bought from her. And the cowboys saw that the oil field workers liked her boots. And that made the cowboys come around. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Lace, lace, lace up boots. Yeah. I get it now. Anybody else? What is your connection to the story? How did you develop an interest in this, and um, how did you go from there? Yeah. Um, I lived in Nocona. My husband was a General Motors dealer in Nocona. He grew up there, and we moved back there in 1979. And Enid was still alive, so I got to know her. She was, you know, she was elderly then. 
Uh, I was in graduate school then, working on my PhD, and I needed to, I needed, I was taking an oral history course and I had to figure out a topic of something to interview people. So I decided the Nocona Boot Company. So I did some interviews. Joe Justin was one of my interviews, and he's the one that gave me the quote about Enid not getting married anymore because she was just creating competition. That quote came from Joe Justin. But I interviewed uh, people that worked at the boot company. Um, but then I put that all aside. I, and I went on and worked on other projects and didn't get back to it till quite a bit later. But it turned out that those early interviews just were invaluable because most of those people had passed away by the time I was actually writing the book, but I had their words. So that really helped with the book. That's a good segue to one of our questions from a Zoom attendee. Where are Miss Enid's scrapbooks today? They're in the museum in Nocona. Uh, Nocona has a wonderful museum, and it's fairly new. It's beautiful. Um, Good, good, glad you've been there. Yes, and can back me up on that. Uh, they have much of Enid's, oh, they have, they have boots, they have equipment, that, but they have a lot of her papers. And among those papers are the scrapbooks that she filled up with all of those. And they're amazing. She also did scrapbooks for the Pony Express race. Yes. I remember the age when that happened, so I, I don't, mm -hmm. I, it could help us a little bit clear that up a little bit. I, I, Wait, before yeah. you answer it, um, for our Zoom people, we have a question of what was the impetus for the move to El Paso, and now I'll turn it to you, Carol. Okay. Um, they just had to downsize, and I think they could produce their product uh, cheaper in El Paso, and they actually, um, did all of the boots in El Paso. They did some other shoes in Caswell, Missouri. So they had a small plant there. But the whole thing was downsizing. I was at the uh, Justin plant yesterday the, on Daggett Street. Um, I did a book signing there. And uh, they toured me through the old factory, which is now, it's now all offices for everyone. But there's still holes in the floor where all the machinery was. So... It, it was really interesting to see. Yeah. yeah. Hey, when they, they changed, you mentioned Justin Boots changed their name to Justin Industries. Yes. I assume that's because they were doing more than boots. What else did they do? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For the Zoomers, um, we had somebody that said that they wanted to know when Justin Boots changed to Justin Industries, what else were they doing? Uh, they acquired Acme Brick which was one of their biggest acquisitions. And, they, um, and then some other building materials companies, and they ultimately decided that uh, bricks and boots didn't go together. And so they had to split it, they, they split it apart. And you know, uh, now it's owned by Berkshire Hathaway. Um, so, and, and it seems to be uh, doing very well. But there's two divisions now. And I think that Justin Brands is what they call the, because now they also have, they now have the three, what were the three, big three boot makers in Texas. Tony Lama, Nocona, and Justin are all under the Justin brand now. So, produced by Justin. Yeah. A lot. There's a lot in the book about that. Both her father and her were always upgrading their machinery anytime new technology came out. She was the first to acquire it, as her father before her had been. So yes, there's quite a bit in the book about that. Um, she was one of the first ones to get the uh, computerized stitching 
and then at one point computerized cutting that would actually cut the leather. So, you know, because that was much later. But she was always ahead of her time on that. Yes, sir. So we have a question, Zoomers, um, from the audience here about um, did Enid have multiple houses in Nakona and uh, are any of them still existing? Three houses. Uh, <clears throat> uh, when she was first married, she lived in a small frame house with no insulation. That was when uh, she had the, the baby girl, the daughter, and when the daughter got sick, the house was so cold, evidently, that she and Julius and the baby moved in with uh, Anna and Daddy Joe, her, her parents, because their house was much warmer then. But then from that house, she bought a small red brick house, it was in Nokonum. And then about the time she built the state-of-the-art factory on the highway, she also built a house, a, a beautiful house in Nokonum, um, a stucco house, that was always bright pink, Pepto-Bismol pink, we're talking. She loved pink. She was a very uh, feminine woman. She didn't wear boots, <laughs> unless she had to, you know, for events or things like that, she would wear boots. But she said, I love boots. I've always loved boots. It doesn't mean I have to wear them. She liked high heels and feminine clothes and pink. Uh, she drove a pink Cadillac. Um, she had a boot weather vane on, her, on top of her house. She had um, a boot um, hood ornament on her pink Cadillac. She was quite flamboyant. She was a character. What, what happened to the uh, boots started by her ex-husband? What happened to those companies? The Olsen Steltzer um, is, has just recently been revived again. And I have a neighbor across the street who just got a pair of Olsen Steltzer boots. So the Whitburn Boot Company did not do well. Uh, it was Harry Whitman and two partners, I think. Um, they didn't have the same expertise and they lasted maybe a couple of years and then Enid got a call one day that all of their equipment was for sale cheap and um, she went to Wichita Falls and bought and this was during the war that happened. And so there were sh a lot of shortages of material. And she went to Wichita Falls and got some of the material that she needed from that Whitburn boot factory that was closing up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You may have said earlier, yeah. how many siblings did she have and did any of them have this drive um, to become successful boot makers or did they all go under the umbrella of the, the Justin brand? Yes. Okay, Zoomers, we have a question here in our live audience about how many siblings did Enid have and if any of them were active with the Justin Boot brands. There were uh, three boys and four girls. Um, John, Earl, and Sam, the boys, all ran the Justin Boot Company in Fort Worth where they worked with their dad in Nocona before they, were there, before they moved to Fort Worth. John was the president, he was the oldest. Uh, the girls, other than Enid, no. They, were all, uh, they all owned stock in the company and they all participated and were like on the board, but none of them were really active in, other than Enid in the boot business. And we Good have, question. We have a question from one of our Zoomers. Uh, do you know the addresses of her homes in Nakona? <gasps> no, I, can't, I can take you right to it, <laughs> but I can't give you the address. I'm sorry. Uh, it, it's not pink anymore. Someone painted it, so. Yeah. Yes. Um, early on, you mentioned <clears throat> when you were talking about the early buildings for the company when her dad was still around. Um, No, oh, okay. Spanish Fort, was that? Fort. That was the original. And there's, and there's a building that still exists? No, oh. that's where, it's, it's strictly a ghost okay. town okay. now. Is, are there any of the old first buildings that are still there? Um, that are still around? Yes, right now, um, her original 
factory on the main street in Okona um, is the retail store for Finolio boots now, which is kind of a nice so connection. Yes. Yes, it's huge. And oh, it was falling down. It was in terrible disrepair. Someone had stolen all the copper, you know, from the air conditioning system. The roof was falling in. It was truly an eyesore. And uh, a, a man from Dallas came and, and bought that building and renovated it. It is beautiful now. The, they, someone still had the No Kona Boot Company sign, the original sign that's back up on the building. But the No Kona Athletic Goods, as I was telling him, is in the east end of it. They're manufacturing their ball gloves and the things they manufacture there. And there's an event center in the middle and some other little things that have changed a lot. On the other end is No Kona Brewery. So a new, new brewery. So the building looks wonderful. And that's just such a great thing for the town of Nocona to have that. All right. Oh, we've got one more question. Okay. Yes, sir. All of the uh, buildings in downtown Nocona that have been uh, redone, not remodeled, but restored. Yes. Yes, he was from Nakona. The, car, the man with the car collection was Pete Harden. Um, he and my husband went from elementary school up through high school in Nakona together. Uh, he was, uh, became an oil man, and he uh, had the wonderful car collection. Um, he died recently, and um, I just learned this last weekend that uh, his wife sold the entire collection to the Meekum auction. And so the car museum is gonna close. But my husband was a collector also, who was the General Motors dealer there. For years now, our dealership is in Bowie, Texas. We moved it to Bowie. But uh, my husband restored his original building in Nocona. It's on the highway also. It was built in 1945. It's, uh, you, you can probably picture it has the round glass you know how the buildings did in the 40s and early 50s. And my husband also had a car collection. So we're kind of hoping to fill in where Pete Harton's car collection left, that maybe we can kind of move ours in and keep it going that way, keep that car collection. That was drawing so many people to Nocona. And it's just a, a sad thing to see it close, but things change. The buildings and the car collection The building, the main... Oh my goodness, the main building, the main car collection was an old Piggly Wiggly building that was restored. Another was a, had been a little grocery store and then was a cleaners, a dry cleaners. That was beautifully restored. But there's also another um, man in Fort Worth who is a member of the Finolio family that is um, very artistic and loves buildings. And he's designed and built and renovated buildings there and he kind of got it going. You know how that's kind of contagious when one building gets fixed up and somebody sees, wow, this is what this could look like. And, and that's what's happened. So a lot of the town has been restored. So I'd, I'd recommend a trip there. It's, it's really neat what they've done. Yes. Oh, yes, yes, there's so much in the story, and I just leave things out. That's when women began working in the boot factory, was when there was a shortage of men who went to war, and uh, the women stayed after the war was over, and uh, oftentimes her, um, her, her production, uh, her boot builders, was uh, 50% uh, women. So she always had a large contingent of women working in the factory. And of course in the office and... Yeah. What else, what was the industry that drew people to that area? What did people do for work other than work in the boot factory? Probably the oil field would be the other biggest. And 
thing, and agriculture. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Y'all have such good questions. Thank you. Oh, they just sold boots. You, you, uh, oh, no, I can't remember the statistic, but it seems like, uh, was it 60% of the shows on TV at one time were Westerns? It was, uh, that, might, that might not be the, the right percentage, but it was a, more than you would think were Westerns. They were so popular. And of course, that just did wonders. And um, then... Um, of course, the John Travolta movie, um, Urban, Cowboy. Urban Cowboy, started in 1980. Started that all over again, and that craze for boots, and that's when the boots even took off up in the Northeast. And people were wearing them in New York City. So. Yes, sir. Well, I see I have to agree. I might be a little prejudiced, so don't, don't tell that. Um, they were just a really quality big, made with lemon pegs, put together with lemon pegs, wood, wood, lemon wood pegs, um, very quality boot. And the interesting thing uh, that I learned while I was writing this um, was that each boot company made a different type of boot. Like if you had a high-end step, you'd want a Tony Lama boot. Uh, if you had a wide foot, you might want a Justin boot. Justin boots were more giving than some of the other boots were. Um, so they were all different and had their own niche, which now I don't think that's the case anymore. I think they've all been kind of generalized now, where they all had their own personality back in those days. But I. I think the Nocona boots were truly wonderful. Yes, sir. You, you mentioned World War II, and that's a fact. Uh, did they uh, not try to uh, make some combat boots along the way? Um, to get into the business, and that also helped your supply side? No, she, she never did. Um, boots were cut. The leather base for a boot is much thinner than a regular shoe or a combat boot. And for that reason, she didn't have to give up her sole leather because, or what had already been cut because they were too thin and they couldn't use them. But she talks a lot about providing cowboy boots for soldiers during the war that wanted their cowboy boots. They'd always worn boots and they wanted, and she would get permission from their commanding officers and make, even pilots. There were some pilots that wore no Kona boots during the war. All right. Well, thank you so much, Carol. It's been a delight. Thank you all. Thank you for coming.